welcome to this uh, fourth webinar in our spring 2019 webinar series for high tunnel producers. Today, I'm excited to have Kathy Demchek with Penn State University. We'll talk about her plastics research and the difference that they can make in your high tunnel. Uh, I'm Cheryl Burns, the Project and Outreach Manager for Capital RCND, and I'll be the moderator for the webinar this morning. Capital RCND is a nonprofit organization operating primarily in South Central Pennsylvania, but for some projects like our high tunnel support, uh, we operate at a statewide level. Um, funding for this webinar series is provided by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. NRCS uh, has funding available to purchase high tunnel technology as well as technical support for eligible applicants. I'll provide a link in follow-up materials and on our website for those that are interested in learning more about this and other NRCS programs. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our presenter, Kathy Demchek, for taking the time to share her research um, and to address our questions. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to Kathy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks Cheryl for the introduction there. So, um, so today I'm going to talk about some research that we've been conducting over the last few years and also some of the um, practical applications of, of that work. So it, the work we've been doing is conducted as part of a USDA specialty crops research initiative project. Michigan State University is the lead. Um, there are another of a number of other institutions here that are involved, including um, Penn State Cornell, um, University of Minnesota, University of New Hampshire um, in Vermont, um, also Rutgers. Um, USDA is involved um, at, from, um, with personnel from two of their sites in Beltsville and Kearneysville, and then also from Lancaster University in the UK. So um, I do need to thank a number of folks. This project would not have come together without a lot of people working together. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank Eric Hansen at Michigan State um, and also Mike Glenn at the USDA, who did a lot of the background work that helped us um, figure out how to move forward with this project. Also, Nigel Paul and Jason Moore at Lancaster University in the UK, who've done um, a lot of work related to plastics quality and characteristics, um, especially as related to ultraviolet light. And then a number of companies who've, who've helped us um, along the way. So what we're going to be talking about today is the plastic films that we typically use on high tunnels. So normally these are six mil, um, thick plastics and typically they are sold as having a four-year um, life and will be referred to as greenhouse grade. So that's the standard type of plastic we're going to be covering today. Now there are a number of other materials out there and um, if you're interested we can you know talk about some of those at the end. Um, but at this point, we were trying to um, compare apples to apples, really. So one thing that's really important that I want to um, point out is if you're new to high tunnels, um, you may be tempted to go to, say, a local home improvement store. You can get um, plastic drop cloths that are six mil thick, and you might be um, tempted to buy something like that. And the problem um, is that a lot of those are really intended for indoor, very short term use. And so they don't have anything um, added to the to the plastic itself to prevent it from breaking down in ultraviolet light, which of course we get from the sun. Um, your typical um, greenhouse films will have additives that prevent the plastic from breaking down in sunlight, and that's why they would last for you know typically four years. Um, without that, they would become brittle and start to break into small pieces within about a year. There may be other additives um, that will affect heat buildup or retention within the tunnel. There may be um, some additives that help with diffusing the light to different extents. Um, in the future, um, we may be seeing some plastic where the wavelengths are actually shifted um, Dif um, differently as they hit the plastic. And so the wavelength they start out with hitting the plastic as it's entering the tunnel may be different than what is coming through um, the inside side. And um, there have been some articles in popular publications related to that. And then there may be other um, 
other additives that are either added to the plastic or that are coating the plastic that might affect how water condenses on them and such. And we'll talk a little bit about those. So I had referred to um, a lot of the work with light. And I just want to, we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on um, this slide as a whole. We will look at some of the sections of it and um, how, how that affects us plant and plant growth and what the tunnel environment's like. But um, basically, if you look at the entire light spectrum, um, you will have ultraviolet light, you have visible light, and then infrared and we'll just take a little bit of a look at each of those. Um, so ultraviolet light is broken down in the UVA and UVB. So these are terms you're probably familiar with when you look at, um, for, for example, a pair of sunglasses that you might be thinking about buying, and you'll see what percentage of protection there is from UVA and UVB. So these are the wavelengths that, that cause us to tan when we're outside. Um, but they can also damage your eyes, which is why we see those um, you know, specifications on sunglasses. It also can cause skin cancer. And so that's also when you look at, you know, a bottle of sunscreen that you might be buying, um, you'll see how much protection you get there. So these aren't, you know, this UV light isn't really something we're not familiar with and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and in, in life. So, you know, so basically you have damage to us. Um, you also, you know, have damage to plants um, from UV light. And so plants respond, um, they can't put on sunscreen, so their response is to produce anthocyanins, which are antioxidants, which help um, help with um, them being damaged by the ultraviolet light. And so that results in some of our health effects um, of berries where you might hear about antioxidant levels. And so, you know, so these are things that we deal with, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, and you know that affect a lot of things. So ultraviolet light. So so this is also what breaks down our plastics, and that's why those stabilizers and blockers are added. Besides the things we had already talked about, um, fungi and insects also sense ultraviolet light, and so um, there is some um, indication that UVA can affect sporulation. Um, it's also, you may be hearing more about um, bees, that they use UVA um, for, for navigation, so do some other insects, and so possibly there can be some effects related to that. Um, and then UVB also affects pesticide breakdown, and so what that means is that when you apply material in the field, um, it, it will be broken down by, you know, combination of exposure to, um, to water and exposure to sunlight and so potentially you could have longer residual activity um, in in high tunnels um, depending on the type of blocker that's there it also means though now I, I do want to point out we won't talk about this in this particular presentation but we did not find higher residues on the fruit when we were we were looking at those we were seeing some um, longer life of the pesticides on the on the leaves, probably because they are there for the entire season and any buildup of pesticides is more likely to be on the leaves than on the portion that we eat that develops and um, is harvested more quickly. Um, but the other part about this is that some of the softer materials that are, for example, organic ones um, or very um, environmentally safe ones could potentially work a little bit um, better in the tunnels. And so so that's a possibility too. So there are a number, a number of things to consider as related to UV light. Um, so if you take a look, this is a graph that we don't have to spend you know, a whole lot of time on, but below 400 um, nanometers is the wavelength that's UVA and UVB. And this is the percentage of light coming into the tunnel in this region. So you'll see that a lot of that has been blocked by this plastic. However, if you look to the right of that, that is the visible light and the light um, that plants are using for photosynthesis. Um, and also um, some of the um, wavelengths that affect heat buildup. So if you look above 400 nanometers um, and, and the bottom x-axis, you'll see that the percent transmission is 80% or higher. And so these films are made to transmit a lot of the light that plants need for photosynthesis right through them. 
and this is very typical of what you'll see. Um, here's a film that, that blocks very little of the ultraviolet, and this one has a stabilizer added to it, so instead of blocking it, it basically the plastic's just been stabilized and the ultraviolet light still goes through. Here's a film that is marketed as friendly to bees, and you'll see here that um, if you look in that 300 to 400 range, um, the UVA, which is what the bees are using for navigation, so just below 400, a good portion of that light is coming through, um, and the intention is that the bees would be able to see better. And it, there are other factors going on to that, and we couldn't really notice any, you know, huge um, differences between the plastics, though, and, and how the bees react to it. And then this is that same film before the additives were changed to make the plastic more bee friendly. So more of the um, UVA was being blocked. So, so if you're buying a film, you know, what are you, what are you looking for on perhaps the packaging or in the literature that's from the company? Um, like, how do you know what you're, you know, what, what you're buying there? And so, um, you know, all the films that are, that are sold for high tunnel or greenhouse use will have something to prevent that, that breakdown from UV light. And the words you may see um, would be UV protected or UV stabilized are the terms that are most commonly used in the literature when you're buying, buying um, the plastic. And you may see the UV effects actually advertised in the company literature. And so usually, um, if you check out specifications on the company website, um, you can get some of this information. But, um, but also, if you... Um, you know, you may need to ask them and you might have to do a little digging around sometimes on the website um, or you may have to ask the company to send you a literature on, on the products. Um, often it's available at trade shows as well if you go to those. So sometimes if you can look around, you will find these, find these things. Okay, so we're going to move on to visible light. So this is what the plants are using for photosynthesis. It's also what we see. So photosynthesis mainly takes place um, with um, blue and red wavelengths. However, we're finding out more and more that um, other wavelengths are responsible for other things such as plant height um, or, you know, just how um, stocky a plant might be. And so, um, so a lot of these wavelengths are, are um, important to the plants. Um, the other thing that can happen with um, with, with visible light is that some plastics will diffuse it, well, in all the wavelengths as well, but some plastics will diffuse light more than others. And so if you look, you see less shading than typically you might in one that doesn't. Um, and so the light will be more evenly spread throughout the plant canopy. Um, one way you can tell is if you look for shadows on the floor, you won't really see the shadows of the tunnel structure on the floor nearly as much in a with a plastic that diffuses light. And so the theory here is that if you have tall plants, um, the lower leaves would be shaded less and you might have more photosynthesis taking place overall. So anyway, so if you take a look, so this again um, is, is a plastic um, and we're just illustrating here that, you know, between 400 and 700 nanometers is, is what's visible. A very high proportion of that is being transmitted through these films. And I just want to show you two. Here's here's a um, here are two tunnels. The one on the top left is um, tough light T4, just to to give you an idea of what um, it looks like. And so you can see that that is a plastic that does not diffuse light very much. So you can actually see into the tunnel. You can see some row cover on the ground. You can see the bows of the tunnel on the far side, um, the shape of those and of the strapping. On the bottom um, right is Cool Light Plus. This one diffuses more. And so you um, can't really see the tunnel structure there very much at all. Now, I do want to point out that when you're looking for the difference between um, to tell whether a plastic diffuses light or doesn't, you need to be some distance from the plastic before you can tell um, whether it's diffusing or not. So, you know, if you got a sample of any of these films and, you know, what, what you'll typically do first is you hold it up and you might put your hand 
behind it and look look at it to see how clear it looks. All of them you will be able to see through very well at that close range. However, the, the diffusion differences, you, you almost need to hold it at arm's length or further away from you to really be able to pick up these differences in diffusion. So, um, so when you compare plastics that are clear versus those that diffuse the light, um, as I mentioned with clear, clear plastics, you'll, you'll see more shadows. Um, typically, you'll have a little more direct heat buildup, so you'll be able to feel it. You might feel hotter. Um, and so, you know, so, so it, it can feel different to you in addition to, you know, being able to tell differences by looking, looking at the plastics. So we used to think this really was important for taller crops, um, especially ones that might prefer cooler temperatures like raspberries. Um, I work with berry crops, and so this was a crop that was of interest to me. Um, we're not really sure that's true, and we'll, we'll take a look at some of the results from our research later on that. Um, but if you look at plastics in general, it seems like there are more options for plastics that diffuse light than, than ones that don't. And so, again, how do you know what you're seeing there? Um, so you may see, um, you may see a percent um, of diffusion that might be specified for different plastics. Um, you may, you'll see other words related to visible light, like highlight transmission. That just means that, you know, a lot of the light is coming through. The ones that diffuse light more, you may see um, some advertisements or, or words in the advertisements for plastic that indicate that you might see less scorching or sun scald on your crop or that you might have less heat buildup. And so, um, you know, there are different ways to tell whether it's a diffusing plastic or not. Um, but you will see, you know, that in general, um, the vast majority of these plastics transmit a high percentage of visible light through. And then we move into infrared. So this is um, the radiation that you will sense is heat. So you know this from like infrared heaters, for example. And so these are... Um, you know, the longer wavelengths of the visible light and then the shorter wavelengths of infrared are what's really heating up your tunnel during the day. And so those are stored in the soil or um, in the, um, you know, in the soil or just in the structure or in any other objects you might have in the high tunnel. Um, those will be, that'll be, these wavelengths will be stored as heat. And then they are emitted back um, as longer wave infrared radiation at night. And so often you'll see in the plastics um, the letters IR, and those are often plastics that contain an additive to block some of the infrared from traveling through through the plastic. If it's an IR plastic, um, usually the intent is to try to retain heat at night, and so that might be an inside layer um, if two layers of cover are applied. And so, um, so you know, the other thing is that you may see these, these plastics um, if they block the shortwave infrared as marketing as reducing temperatures. So, um, so here's a film that doesn't block infrared. So we're looking, you know, in above 700 nanometers. So the right hand side of this line. So this is when it doesn't block infrared. And this is one that blocks um, at least the shortwave infrared. So you can see a major drop off in that. Um, this particular one is Cool Light Plus, and it, and it does feel cooler during the day um, under that plastic. Still warmer than outside, but cooler than um, other plastics. And so what you look for is, um, you know, in the literature for plastic, um, something that um, indicates that it's a plastic that, that will tend to cool temperatures. You'll see the, the letters in for um, IR or T. TES, which stands for thermal energy saving in the film name. Um, and so that, that all depends, you know, affects what effects it's going to have. And so some of the other characteristics, you might see um, the words anti-condensate or the letters AC. And the um, intent of these plastics is to keep water from dripping on your plants. I mean, you really don't want to feel like you're being rained on when you're in the tunnel. And so if you look at the um, water droplets um, that condense on the plastic, you will see that they tend to stay very small and they cling to the surface. Um, they may eventually coalesce and run down the side of the plastic, but they will tend to drop on you less. Um, and so so the anti 
condensate materials can be applied in two ways. One is that it could be a coating on the plastic. And so on the plastics where that's the case, um, you will see um, something printed on the plastic that will indicate that you need to keep one side of the plastic towards the interior of the tunnel. So, you know, it may just say inside um, on printed on the plastic. And so you need to be careful how you apply that type of plastic. It can be a problem if you are cutting the plastic into smaller pieces, perhaps to um, do a portion of an end wall or you need to repair something. Um, and if you happen to cut off a piece that doesn't have any of that printing on it, um, it might be a little a little difficult to know which side is the side you should be putting towards the inside. Um, you can tell um, by looking at the plastic and holding it so lights reflecting off of it and usually the interior surface will be a little bit duller and the exterior surface will be a little more shiny. So that's, we found that out the hard way. So anyway, and then some other plastics, um, the um, additive will be incorporated into the plastic and then which side is up doesn't matter. And so that additive migrates to the surface as it's, as it's washed off. And um, so those plastics typically will not have any labeling on them indicating that there's an inside or an outside. And then anti-dust, um, these will have an additive that will tend to repel um, dust from clinging to, to the plastic so much. So you don't have a cut down and light transmission over time from, from um, dust or soil particles sticking to the plastic. Okay, so coming to the thickness of the plastic, so six mils what standard. Um, even when a material is, has been sold as, um, was sold to us as six mil, um, plastic. Sometimes it was a little bit thicker than that. You could really feel the difference, um, you know, once you feel a bunch of plastics. Um, there are formal um, plastics that are um, easier to use on something like low tunnels, or actually you'd want even something even, even thinner than that, though, preferably. So anyway, so most of these will be um, combinations of some of these features, and the name will be a clue that will um, tell you what you should be should be using. So you want to talk to the manufacturer um, about your um, primary uses for the tunnel and what um, you know what their their plastics might do. So question is, does does any of this um, really really make a difference? So um, so we've you know, we, we're doing research on it. There isn't a tremendous amount of information out there. Um, you know, you need a lot of individual tunnels really to be able to determine these effects. Um, out at our research um, facility at Penn State, we have a lot of smaller tunnels that are smaller than the commercial ones. We have about 18 that we're using for this testing. Um, and, you know, if you have a lot of larger tunnels, it becomes very quickly, very difficult to manage them all. Um, and so that's why ours are a little smaller than the commercial ones, um, well, quite a bit smaller than commercial ones. It's a typical, typical width for what had been standard a few years back. Um, we're finding our light effects are still, still valid though, even with this, this somewhat smaller size, um, just because of the light, the way the light comes into the tunnel. You really only see, um, a lot of differences right along the edges. So our first step was that we identified available plastics that were out there. Um, we stopped trying to identify which plastics were available when we had hit 132 different brand names um, from different companies. And at that point, we thought we'd pretty well covered it. So we tried to um, then limit um, what we were looking at to plastics that were available in um, in North America, except for a couple experimental ones we were interested in trying. So we tested over 50 of these plastics and categorized them um, it, um, by doing some of these measurements, light measurements um, in Kearneysville at the USDA facility. And then we chose ones that had um, some diverse light transmitting characteristics because we really wanted to be able to explore the range of effects. So I'll just show you very quickly what we um, ended up testing. The little box is the box of visible 
um, light that you would be able to see. To the left is ultraviolet, to the right is infrared. And these are, are different tunnels um, with the different plastics on them. These are measurements actually taken inside of the tunnels. So this, for example, in the upper left, um, you were looking at what the measurements would be like outside. Um, these, are, these are actually tunnels we have that don't have any plastic on them. Below that, you see the light transmittance in the tunnels that um, had tough light T4. Below that, an experimental um, one that we knew would transmit um, a good portion of the ultraviolet light through. And then we have Ginniger Sun Saver up in the upper right, um, Cool Light Plus. In the, um, these are, these different lines are, um, you know, our three tunnels that had that plastic on. And then below that, an experimental ultraviolet blocking plastic. And so this was our high tunnel facility. Um, as we were starting the project, we um, we had some um, tunnel uh, leftover tomatoes. You're seeing some tunnels in the upper picture that had tomatoes in them from an earlier project. Um, but basically, we ended up taking our tunnels and taking the plastic off of all of them. Um, then we recovered them with our experimental plastic. So in the bottom picture, you're seeing um, an assortment of tunnels in different stages of plastic covering. You're also seeing some tunnel parts there for some additional tunnels that we built. So this is out at our, our research facility. We eventually got them all covered. Um, and then we started to grow our plants in them. So here we were looking at strawberries and raspberries. Um, we were growing them in pots. And so this was a system we were using. That was because whenever we did our testing of the soil in our tunnels, um, they had been used, you know, as you saw from the picture with the tomatoes, for a number of different crops over the years that had been fertilized in different ways. And so what happened was that our soil pH varied quite well widely between the tunnels, um, as did our phosphorus and potassium and magnesium and calcium levels. So, so we didn't want to be um, testing, you know, soil effects. We wanted to be testing plastic cover effects. So we had to move into a containerized system. So all the plants would be receiving the same nutrients. And the effects we would be looking at would actually be those of the plastics. So what we had was um, these five experimental plastics plus one's um, tunnels with no cover. We were looking at two cultivars of raspberries, Polka and Josephine. Um, Albion strawberry, which is a day neutral strawberry, so it fruits all of season long. The two raspberry cultivars we had were Prima Cane fruiters, and um, those are ones that would produce fruit on both last year's canes and the current year's canes, so you get a very long harvest season out of them. And these experiments were first established in 2016. Um, a second, we were only growing our strawberries um, for one year at a time, so we reestablished those in 2017 and then carried over our raspberry planting um, over the winter. And this is towards the end of um, the planting year on ra our, with our raspberries. So as, as usual, they grow very quickly um, in the tunnels. Um, what we found was that the raspberries grew almost too well. So if you look, um, this is one of our pots in 2018 as we were continuing these experiments and where we really had a lot of prima cane growth. And so we needed to thin canes out there. Our raspberry quality, um, as usual, was very good. And then our Albion strawberries also um, had some excellent fruit quality um, as well. All of our crops were grown pesticide free. So um, because we wanted to be able to look at um, effects on pests in the tunnels um, as well. So we harvested our, um, our plants um, three times per week. So um, in 2016 with our strawberries, um, we were harvesting, had 47 harvests. So we harvested those from July 29th through November 14th. They weren't planted until the very beginning of June, which was probably a little bit late. Um, then our raspberries, we um, got some floor cane fruit and then um, prima cane fruit or current year growth um, fruit through November 14th. Then 2017, um, we planted our strawberries a little bit earlier, so we harvested for a couple of weeks longer. 
the raspberries were ready to go right at the beginning of the season. So we had 70 harvests of our raspberries and we got data on our marketable and total yield, berry weight, and our percentage marketable fruit. <laughs> So taking a look at the results um, from our raspberries, now we did continue into 2018 with these as well. If you take a look in 2017 on the cultivar Josephine, um, it really seemed to um, matter um, not a tremendous amount really to, to Josephine in 2017. Um, as you can see there, um, compared to the open tunnels, all of them produced a lot more fruit, um, which is typical in high tunnels than they did when they, you know, were out, the plants were um, in an unprotected environment. And so not a tremendous amount of difference. Um, if I do want to point out that the T4, um, the top flight four, did produce yields, you know, as high or higher um, numerically than the other ones. Also, if you looked at polka, um, you'll see that the yield was actually highest um, with the T4 on that one, significantly higher than all of the other plastics. This is pretty much opposite what we expected, quite honestly. Um, and so I'm really glad we did the research. So why did we see this difference in these two cultivars? Well, if you look at Josephine, um, this was um, a cultivar that is very, very tall and tends to have a more narrow canopy. And so we're thinking that, you know, we had expected that the diffusing plastics um, might, you know, might perform better um, on this one. We really don't think, think that it did um, because when you looked at that one, you know, we're, we're just thinking that maybe the plant shading, whether the plastic was diffusing or not, might have been um, sort of, I don't want to say not all the leaves were being exposed to all of the light effects. And so maybe that's why we weren't seeing much difference on that one. Polka tends to be a wider, shorter, broader, um, more um, tends to have more of like an umbrella shaped canopy. And so that one was intercepting light um, to greater um, to a greater degree just from the plant size and shape. Also, um, you know, we're thinking with this one that it just just tended to not shade itself quite as much. And there we actually could see some of the light effects um, have an effect, you know, the light um, have more of an effect. And so we think that's what's going on. There also probably were some other things that were happening too. And then we continued to um, harvest this. This is just the floor crane or just the summer crop. Um, but you'll see basically the same effects were occurring here with the exception being that the T4 seemed to do a little bit better with Josephine earlier in the year. Um, and so, you know, this this may have been a, also a carryover effect. So we're, we continue to fruit these through the rest of 2018. We don't have the data analyzed on that yet. You'll also see that over on the right, um, we don't have data under the UV clear and the UV blocking for polka. That's because we had removed polka from these tunnels and um, we had actually changed the um, objective of the experiment in those tunnels where we were looking to see whether we could see any UV effects um, related to spotted wing drosophila. We, um, the jury's still out on that one. We don't think there were big effects what we um, from the plastics themselves, although they um, we were seeing some trends that we're still sort of trying to sort out there and figure out what was happening. What we did find though was also in these experiments, we had done some work with harvest in interval on spotted wing drosophila. And if you can with raspberries, take the harvest interval down to a daily harvest instead of an every um, two or three day harvest, you can really drop spotted wing drosophila numbers tremendously to the point where we were um, seeing only maybe 10, 10 to 20 percent as much fruit infestation just by changing the harvest interval. And so that was that was an interesting finding there. So if you looked um, at some of the temperature effects um, that might have been explaining what we were seeing, if you looked um, at the T4, this is compared to, this is the temperature increase compared to what we were seeing on um, different dates in um, 
in the different tunnels compared to outside. And so you can see that the T4 um, on one of the dates warmed up quite a bit as they did the UV clear. And so these were um, these were two two plastics that you know it kind of actually surprised us with the UV clear. It turned out there was another reason for that. Um, with the T4, what we were seeing was some direct um, warm up. With the UV clear and T4, what it turns out might have actually been a factor is that the plants tend to transmit less water and so the leaves actually heat up a bit and so it turns out that that mechanism is actually regulated regulated by uv light um but anyway but the t4 um was was you know of the plastics you would be likely to buy on the market was the warmest one the cool light plus was was quite a bit cooler um and then sun saver was vinegar sun saver was intermediate and then Comparing the UV clear to the UV blocking, that was that um, water use effect um, right there that we're seeing on on those two differences. So looking at our strawberries, so we'll move back onto those. So if you take a look, um, our yields, this is pounds of yield per plant, and um, we were right around 90% marketable fruit um, on on all of the in all of the tunnels. Um, so here, um, when you look at 2016, Cool Light Plus, Sun Saver, T4, um, you know, the, the Cool Light tended to be um, among the higher, as did the Sun Saver, but we're still only talking, you know, a tenth to, you know, a, um, a little bit more um, of a pound difference per for different treatments. If you look in 2017, um, we had no significant difference between any of the plastics. This was when we had moved up our planting date a little bit. Um, we also started to figure out how to grow these plants a little bit better. Um, all of them, of course, were significantly different from open. We didn't have an open treatment in 2016 um, with our strawberries. Um, we did in 2017 though. So all of our differences in 2017 were really due to the fact that we had an open treatment to compare things to. So the strawberries seem to care a little bit less. Now, why is that? Um, we think part of it, well, we'll go into it a little later, but part of it's just because the plants are shorter. So they tended to see a little more, a bit more of the light that was coming in through the sides because they were right down at ground level. Um, and so we didn't really have probably as, as much um, plastic effect as we did with the raspberries. So the theory is that raspberries and strawberries do best in cool temperatures. And so we expected that one that, you know, the coolest plastics would perform the best. Um, we also thought that the fusing plastics that would result in more light to the lower parts of the canopy would, would do best. And so we thought either Kool Aid Plus or those experimental plastics would result in the highest yields. Um, what it turns out is that with strawberry, we didn't see any big differences um, between plastic types in the yield or the pest complexes we saw in the strawberries. And so, you know, on the on the one hand, you might think you'd want to see a difference, but what this did tell us was that there's there's a, a bit of a range in plastic prices, and so there wasn't really reason to recommend a more expensive plastic. So I think that's a useful um, a useful point because um, plastic is not not cheap. And there, um, you know, as mentioned, we think we might not have seen those differences because the plants were shorter. Now with our raspberries, we haven't analyzed the data, all the data from 2018, but um, it looked like the plastic that resulted in the highest yields, which um, tended to be the T4, um, was also the least expensive in our price um, comparison. And it is a widely available plastic um, from a US manufacturer. Now, we had a, a sister experiment to this under low tunnels, and I'm hoping these colors show up um, on your computer screens. But early on, we had mentioned that um, when you block ultraviolet light, um, you are affecting, well, block or allow act, um, ultraviolet light through, you're having an effect on antioxidant production, which is what's responsible for the color. And um, these were where we were looking at strawberries on different types of mulch out in the field under low tunnels that had the same plastics on them. 
And one thing we could find is when we were on white mulch and using T4 that the berries tended to be a redder color. Um, I don't know if that really, um, it, you know, these are not huge differences, but it's just one of those things where, you know, you could notice a very slight difference out there in the field. Um, the plastics or the strawberry plants that had no um, low tunnel cover on them which is the first column of colors you'll see on the left tended to be a little browner. That was because those berries also tended to have more anthracnose. We're thinking, even though we didn't measure right on the, um, take light reading or color readings right on the anthracnose spots, we're thinking that maybe some, um, some of the disease progression might have been beginning to affect the, the quality of the fruit tissue itself. And so you ended up with a slightly browner color with some of those readings. So where it got really interesting though was with our raspberries when we, um, as we always knew, found that, you know, not only do Japanese beetles really love raspberry plants, but they really love them in a bad Japanese beetle year, which we had, this is a picture from 2016. Um, we also had even higher numbers in 2017. So these were, this is a picture of a raspberry plant outside. Um, what was interesting was that we started to notice that under the UV blocking plastics that we had almost no Japanese beetles. And so we started collecting data on Japanese beetle counts um, by, um, you know, taking the beetles. We actually were collecting them into plastic bags and counting them all on off of all the plants and the tunnels and, and collecting data on that. And if you looked at our counts in 2017, these are the total number of beetles that we got over the course of the season. So this JD196 that you see on the left side of the graphs, this was um, in the middle of July. This was a dual, um, the date when the beetles were starting to show up in July. And then we were collecting them through the end of, end of August. So this was over about a 48-day period there. And so um, so if you look at the Josephine on the left, um, the blue line at the very top is the open tunnels where we had um, no plastic cover on. So off of 12 of those plants, we were collecting um, about roughly 900 Japanese beetles off those plants that had landed on them. And so that's, you know, a pretty, pretty amazing number of beetles to see. Um, then when you looked, um, the next line down was our KL plus. So with that plastic, we had about half as many beetles. Below that's T4 and the UV clear. So all of these were the ones that were allowing some of the UVA light through, um, blocking most of the, um, well, the, the KL plus was blocking most of the UVB, but the UV clear and the T4 were allowing all the UV through. So, so we had, um, you know, our beetle numbers cut about in half by, by using those two plastics. But then when you look to the sun saver and the UV blocking, we had relatively very low numbers um, of beetles from those two plastics. If you looked at polka, um, the plant polka plants tended to be smaller, and so um, our numbers tended to be a little bit lower overall on those. And if you look, though, again, the same effects were open. We had a lot of beetles, then the KL plus T4 and UV clear were the next ones um, in terms of numbers of beetles. And then again, our UV blocking, we had almost no beetles on those at all. And um, Sun Saver, we had some. So the um, plastics was making a huge difference in the number of beetles um, that were on the plants. And so, you know, so our overall conclusion, especially um, related to, to, to beetles, um, especially the Japanese beetles, was that plastic type does matter. And so, you know, so what plastic are you really going to want to use? Well, the effects may vary with the crop and the pest complex it's likely to have. So, for example, if you're growing something that doesn't, um, is, that isn't affected, for example, by Japanese beetle, um, it may not matter, matter, matter so much. So there could be, you know, trade-offs on which plastic is best for you, depending on what's most important to you. Um, we are looking deeper into the reasons for some of the results. 
Um, and, you know, we're trying to figure out what was going on and what we really think was happening that was especially for the brambles. Um, we're in, because we're located in central PA and we think the same thing would happen anywhere that is a little cooler this, than this, that the spring and fall temperatures may be the driver of yield more so than the summer temperatures. So we thought that hot summer temperatures would decrease the growth. If it does, um, that's outweighed, we think, by the warmer temperatures that we're seeing under these plastics in the spring and fall um, that are helping to extend the season. And so we think that's a big portion of the reason for these, these differences. That also means that this may be important, very important for growers who have, who want to get an early market season and have an early spring crop or a late harvest season and want to prolong harvest into the fall, that in those cases it may be more important to have a plastic that, that warms the tunnel up faster in the springtime. So um, the other thing we found, though, was that the light levels really drop a lot in the tunnels um, as we were looking at light readings throughout the year. And the light levels were lower than we expected that they should have been based on the sun angle. Um, um, more so than we thought. And so part of that was due to the sun angle, but also um, our collaborators in the UK were looking at this and realizing that we, when the sun angle is low, we get more reflection off the tunnel than we thought. And so that might be an important consideration for growers in northern areas. So again, you might want to make sure that the plastic you have does transmit a very high proportion of the visible light. Um, and if you take, I just want to illustrate it here. If you look, this is our sun angle at Rock Springs. Um, the the um, sun, which is a little on the gray side, but um, in um, June, um, we have this very high sun angle where the light is coming directly into the tunnel. And then if you look at the December sun angle, you see that um, the sun is very low in the sky. And, um, you know, it's not surprising then that you would get some more reflection off of the plastic. So we think that might be explaining those big decreases in light coming into the tunnel bigger than we expected um, during the fall, spring and winter time. So coming back to um, some of this applicability, um, especially when it comes to pest management considerations, um, especially as related to Japanese beetles, is that we think this might be more important for organic producers where chemical control options are limited um, and when any materials that might be used. Um, this is, you know, like say, especially important if you're growing raspberries, but also um, producers of cherries in high tunnels or some of the cut flowers that tend to be very attractive to Japanese beetles and also ornamentals. Um, you know, if you're using, um, but especially if you're organic with a food crop, if you're using a material that has short residual activity, that can uh, be an issue. So, so there's a lot of things, um, you know, to consider on this, um, especially related as to individual operations. So, so for right now, for what to use, you know, we're recommending P4 where light levels are low. Um, if you're organic, um, you may want to use one that blocks some of the ultraviolet light, but it still has a high light transmission. So material light like sun saver might meet all these, um, all these characteristics. If you are growing a crop where you might have trouble with sun scald or you're in a very hot area, we still are um, saying that KL plus or diffusing plastic is more likely a better choice there. Um, if we had been seeing bigger yield differences, I might not say that so much, but um, if sun scald can be an issue, you still want to protect those crops. And you know, we just recommend that maybe growers try a few different plastics to see if you can tell a difference. Um, on your own farm, you may, especially if you have more than one tunnel um, to cover. So one of the other questions about these plastics was what about durability? And so if you compare a six mil plastic to another six mil plastic, what we were seeing was not so much that the plastic broke down um, just by the plastic itself deteriorating. Um, as much as the fact that we were seeing some tearing um, at attachment points. If you were using a track that tends, um, that holds the plastic by snapping into place, we were seeing more damage. If you used a track with a wiggle wire, um, we were seeing less damage. If you were using batten tape on the end walls and stapling it in, that was where we were tending to see a lot of damage. Um, also, if the plastic was ever folded um, for shipping, 
um, the plastic would break down right where that first fold was made. And so even if it's shipped on a roll, um, you know, you, you, you can't ship a 30 foot long roll. So the plastic is always folded, you know, in some, at some location. And so where that crease is, is where you'll often see um, the plastic start to tear first, much like it would if you, you know, ran your fingernail over a piece of paper when you fold it, um, so you can tear it. The same thing happens with the plastic. Um, we're also saying if you want to improve durability, um, some of the things that you do want to do is avoid a large space that doesn't have any backing. So, for example, um, an end wall, um, you might want to put a diagonal, you know, um, piece of wood in an end wall if there's a big big space um, because you'll have more flexing and then more pressure buildup on a bigger um, unbacked space. We're also really recommending including corner baffles inside of the tunnel to keep air from coming in. We did have a fair amount of damage this past winter um, when we had one little um, event, well, a big event, where um, our peak wind was 58 miles an hour out at the research farm um, for each of 10 minutes of peak wind speed measurements, um, and we had an average wind speed of 41 miles an hour over an hour. And what we found there was our winds were coming directly from the west, but all of our damage on the tunnels were on the east. And um, from some work that our cooperators um, in at Rutgers are finding, is that you know, it's the, the damage you see is a combination of pressure buildup inside of the tunnel, and that's why you want to put those those corner baffles in. And also um, uh, some suction that is coming over the tunnel and pulling the plastic out. So you both pressure build up on the inside and plastic, um, you know, suction happening um, on the on the outside. And the combination of those two, we ended up with damage on the east, even though the winds were from the west. And so that was a bit of a learning experience. Um, the according to the folks in Rutgers, a lot of this pressure buildup does happen mostly at the peak and at the hip board area. So um, another question might have is do differences in plastic costs pay? And so if you look at the costs per square foot, um, some of the um, cost differences you see might be more so due to the distributor. So you might want to look around at, a, at different distributors. Um, in part, this is due to, to quantity, perhaps, of so smaller quantities are being sold or smaller pieces are being sold, the cost per square foot will tend to go up. Um, and so um, some things to keep in mind are you had to check different places for the same type of plastic you might want to get. But another thing that is a big factor is the shipping cost. Um, that can often be 40% of the plastic price. And so you might want to check into that, too. Um, and then the other thing is, though, that, you know, if you have something that's available locally that you can pick up, um, it might be worth it to buy more expensive plastic locally rather than to ship a cheaper plastic a longer distance. So we are looking at some of the economics of these different costs um, to see whether they really, you know, tell us anything else. So if you want to find more information on the plastics, I will give you um, the website address at the end of this talk. Um, there is information, of course, on the manufacturers and distributors um, websites, but the table you see on the right does exist on our Tunnelberries website, which I'll show you. Now, you know, the names of these um, plastics and which are available, new ones are being developed all the time. So this is a bit of a moving target and changes over time. And then one of the other questions related to plastics, you know, that we're hearing a lot and, you know, that is a concern is what about the plastic waste generation? We were looking at that as a part of our project. Um, unfortunately, at this point, the recycling market has, you know, has, has um, kind of dissolved <laughs> to some extent. Um, we were looking at some components related to making it easier for growers to recycle plastics, but right now the economics just isn't there to be able to make that happen. Um, there are a lot of things related to trying to weigh all the environmental benefits versus costs of using the plastics, um, like how does you know growing food locally in a tunnel compared to you know trucking food across a country or in from another country. Um, there, there's a lot to consider there, and it's really difficult to, 
you know, to sort it all out. Um, my hope is that, you know, somewhere down the road, we'll have a, a truly biodegradable plastic that we can use, but we're still a little ways from that. So, um, so the work um, it was funded by um, the USDA as part of the USDA Specialty Crops Research Initiative Program. Um, our project is Tunnelberries. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, the opinions are not do not reflect the, um, those of USDA necessarily, but do reflect our research findings. Um, this is, if you visit our Tunnelberries website, this is the first page that you will see. And um, www.tunnelberries.org. And so the updated information will be there as this project moves along. We're going to continue to do some more research. Um, we are doing a grower um, survey related to um, some of the you know, effects of using plastics and what they're seeing. And so that will be coming out in a while. And then we'll just let things go with that. So I guess I'll turn things back to Cheryl at this point. Hi, Kathy. Thanks so much. Um, I know there's a lot of great information that you covered, and, um, uh, you know, I have a lot of questions. Um, I want to also um, let folks know that if they have questions, they can either type them in the box or raise their hand. Um, you mentioned that you were going to be doing additional research this year. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, of course, I wanted to ask uh, if you could give us any hints about what you might be looking at. Mm-hmm. So some of the things we're, we're continuing to look at, we're really trying to sort out this temperature difference versus plastics difference. Um, we're taking a lot more data on air and soil temperature, just trying to get an idea of what was really the important driver there. Um, there's some things related to raspberries where they hot soil temperatures don't seem to, to bother them. Um, it seems to be the... Um, we, which is different than what we expected. We always think of them as being a, a cool cool season plant, and that seems to be more important for the top part of the plants rather than the bottom. But we're just trying to figure out, you know, what's more important here. So, for example, if the soil temperature is more important, could you get, you know, some of these benefits by putting down, for example, in a different type of plastic, maybe a black landscape fabric? You know, like, are there, are there different ways that you could manipulate the environment to really... Um, you know, to, to really affect plant growth. Um, but we're also looking at, there's a venting um, component where we're looking at some automation because that was something growers had told us they wanted to work on. So we're looking at some different automation options together with um, remote greenhouses and advancing alternatives, which is um, and, and a supplier of Rimmel, um is is helping us with looking at some different options there. We're also trying to look at um, related to some of these pest complexes, for example, like the Japanese beetles. We're seeing um, from some other research that, that you know, there are other pests that may be affected similarly that are um, big problems in the beetle family, like rose chafer, um, oriental beetle. And we were also actually in one of our strawberry experiment, experiments seeing some differences related to tarnished plant bug um, incidents and population buildup and damage. And so, so anyway, so we're going to be looking at um, wavelengths more closely to try to sort out whether there can be, you know, an additional role um, perhaps to help with um, decreasing pesticide usage on some of these crops. But also, um, you know, as we're working with the manufacturers, um, you know, we're working with some of the plastics manufacturers to, to see if we can make some adaptations maybe to get, you know, some of this, the benefits, I guess, into, into growers' hands. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, now, will, will there be any, anything about high tunnels at, at progress days this year? Yes, so we'll be doing six tours, um, six bus tours, so two tours on each of the three days of Ag Progress Days. Um, if things go according to plan, we may also actually have a much larger movable tunnel in place by then. Mm -hmm. So not only will we have the berry, um, some, some of our berry work continuing, we're also putting some tunnels, um, some vegetable crops into some of the tunnels this year. 
um, and we are working on having some tunnel demonstration information um, out at Ag Progress Days itself. Um, if everything pulls together um, the way we're hoping it to, it will. So that's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know we'll, you know, knowing that, and some of the other projects we work on are going to have demonstrations. So I, we'll we'll be. Uh, hopefully putting some things on our website, but I'm sure, uh, th will that be promoted in the tunnel berries? Yes, it'll, it'll be yeah. on the tunnel berries website. Um, also on the ag progress days site, although I think they're probably only mentioned under the tours, you know, there's so many different things happening. Right. So it'll probably <laughs> be like a sentence somewhere in the program. But yes. Yeah, no, that's great. No, that's good to see. Um, and I also wanted to ask about the grower survey. So, um, if somebody wants to participate in that and maybe hasn't participated in Penn State events before, mm -hmm. uh, is, is there a way that they can be in touch to make sure that they're included in that? Yes, yes, so absolutely. So, um, so I'm thinking what the best way is to go about this. So we'll probably be advertising it through um, some of the grower associations, um, but also, you know, so like PASA, um, PVGA, um, State Hort Association of Pennsylvania. Um, this is something where we definitely will have a link to it on the Tunnelberries website also. Um, and maybe you and I should talk to see if you have some other suggestions <laughs> related sure. to getting the word out to making sure everybody's, you know, reached who should be, who might be interested in participating. So. And are you looking primarily just at Pennsylvania? No, we'd actually be looking at doing that countrywide. Awesome. So the more respondents we get, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I wanted to make sure that, um, uh, yeah, to ask that specifically, just because sometimes mm -hmm. it's a focused area. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Kathy and I had talked previously about the recycling issue, and mm -hmm. uh, in our office, we've talked about trying to look at uh, hosting either a webinar or even a discussion session of some kind uh, about ag plastics, not just recycling, but, um, you know, issues with their use and disposal. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as, as that's developed, uh, we'll put out information. If there are specifics within that topic that folks would like to hear about, we'd love to know so that yeah. we can include that in that uh, conversation. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Yep, you know, that's one where, you know, we were finding really the economics were the big driver of it. Mm. And so the company we were working with was was looking at, um, they were looking at actually, you know, doing something, I don't know if you've seen those, like, bags that you can get at all, you know, some of the big um, big consumer construction type, <laughs> you know, businesses, but oh, sure. um, where, you know, you there would be like a, you know, you can basically get a dumpster that looks like a big bag. And so when, one of the concerns was that growers were saying they were having trouble, like knowing where to store plastic on their farm and how to keep it clean, um, you know, keep water out of it, you know, which the recyclers needed it to be dry, you know. And so there were yeah. all these factors. And so what they were looking at was recycl getting recyclable bags out. The growers could actually compress a bunch of plastic, you know, just push it into basically a big bag, which the company was then going to be picking up. And they were doing a pilot project up in the middle, Midwest, upper Midwest and hoping to expand east um, with the recycling market, you know, kind of fizzling there on um, that part of the. And so that was something we were help, helping, hoping to be able to help roll out to growers so that they would have an easy way of recycling plastics. Um, and um, that kind of isn't moving along as well as we would have liked it to. I think maybe in a different environment, maybe right. maybe we would have, you know, been in better shape on that one. You know, hopefully over time, some options will come back around again. But they seem not yeah. to be there at the moment. I still think it's important to keep the conversation moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think that's it for today. Uh, but Kathy, thank you again for taking the time to put together the great information and for doing the research. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes sure. we don't celebrate that as much as we should. So um, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. And thanks uh, to the participants. Um, Kathy, any closing thoughts? 
no, not really. Just would love to see everybody out at the high tunnel facility during Ag Progress days. Um, we're also available, you know, at other times when we do. If growers want to just stop by and see what we're doing, um, you know, contact Cheryl has my contact information, or you can find me on the Penn State website. We're always happy to have anybody, you know, wants to come out and um, take a look at what's going on. Oh, you always do great work. Well, thanks again. And um, and take care, everyone.